Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome back to another You Be the Behavior Consultant. Just checking to see if I am there. Oh, I am. Woo, loud and clear. I'm going to turn that down so I'm not blasting in my ear. There we go. Uh, so good to see everybody. Hope you had a great holiday. Very excited to be back with you. It's been a while. I was out on the road consulting and also uh, at a conference. So lots of great learning going on in the past few weeks. And we get to enjoy a little bit of it today in this You Be the Behavior Consultant because we're going to look at some new videos. So uh, I know a lot of people. Oh, and some happy holidays from everybody. <laughs> and Cynthia, you got to join us finally. Yay. Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm hoping some of you are able to join me today. I know some people might be on break or some people may be covering for other people at work. So it's a busy week, but um, we have a really good topic this week. Um, we're going to talk about systematic desensitization. My brain is spinning right now just thinking about all the things we need to discuss about this topic. So let's get into it. This is You Be the Behavior Consultant, a live stream. I try to do most Mondays. We did take a little break due to all the travels, but we're back this week and this is how it works. So I present a topic for discussion. Um, I've got some questions to prompt uh, your participation participation. There we go. I've got some videos, some new videos for us to look at. And then we're going to wrap, wrap it all up at the end with a, uh, a recap. And um, oh, and uh, um, everyone is uh, excited about this topic. Good, good, good. I am too. This one really has my brain spinning. So um, I hope you all will join in the discussion to share your thoughts on it. Okay, so we're going to talk about systematic desensitization. First of all, um, if anyone has a has some some thoughts on how to define it, um, please, please jump in. Obviously, I'm going to provide a definition that I've found for you. I did a lot of reading the last couple of days, um, found some really good resources on it. Um, and, uh, and then what I thought we'd also talk about is is what do we think the um, processes are, um, what the learning processes are that are involved in systematic desensitization. And then here's where it gets really fascinating. What does it look like? in animal training. This is this is where I was really um really getting challenged um in uh trying to describe it and I've got some videos that I think are maybe what we think it looks like in animal training or or maybe not. <laughs> That's where I think the discussion is going to get really interesting. And then I also want to talk about other strategies that people have used to address fear responses. So um, so those are my my questions that I'm going to throw out there to get our conversation started. So um, so if anybody feels like jumping in with some, some experiences, some thoughts, um, what's your experience been with systematic desensitization or what, what you have been taught about it, I think that's really kind of a starting point for a lot of us is that, you know, when we start talking about behavior science, um, you know, this is just what we've been taught, you know, our start, our starting point. And, um, and for me in reading the, um, the journal articles and books and whatnot that I went to on this topic, um, it was very enlightening. <laughs> and I kind of think our journey is not really done on, to, on, on, um, uh, exploring this topic. So this is really kind of a good one to to get started started um, exploring. Um, I have a feeling we're going to have more discussions on this in the future too. So so what do you guys think? Anybody have any thoughts? Like what is it? I don't know. What is what have you been told systematic desensitization is? What is it? What does it look like to you when you try to apply it? Ooh, and, and Anne says she's excited for this topic too. <laughs> and that and she's excited that other people are interested in it as well. Yeah, it's one that um you know, I, th I kind of felt like, oh, I thought I, I thought I have a handle on this. I think I know this. But the the you know, again, the, <laughs> the longer I've been in the business, the more I go, oh, I don't know that I understand this at all. But <laughs> but, you know, what the heck? We should we should have a conversation about it and see what we all have been taught and what we think about it now and you know, what else we've learned about addressing fear responses. Everyone's feeling a little shy about this one. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. I do have quite a few videos. So if you want me to go into my definitions, I can and, and we can look at videos and, and um, explore those as well and see what we think. Um, I did, uh, for those of you that are members, I do have quite a few references that we'll um, get into. And um, 
and um, those will be available to you for to explore many of them are open open source so you can find them yourself um, so Cynthia says it takes a long time if used alone in my experience it has to be used with other procedures yeah I think that's a really good comment um, I think as I was as I was looking especially at my own videos um, and also reading the journal articles uh, I would say the articles that other people wrote where, where they were applying it, especially with animals, I think what started to become really um, an interesting question to explore was, you know, is it really possible to use on its own, so to speak, especially in the animal training community? That was the question that kind of kept coming up is like I would, I would read um, a method that was described and I was like, mm, I don't know if that was just systematic desensitization. And, you know, there was a moment there where clearly there was some reinforcement that went on that maybe wasn't acknowledged by the author or maybe they didn't notice it. So, so that, you know, could be a thing. Uh, and Anne says, uh, yes, I feel the same way. It's important when working with animals, but I get confused as well. Yeah, and I think that's that's why this is a good topic to discuss because I feel like it is a little bit confusing. Um, and so that's why it's a fun one to talk about. Maybe, um, maybe I'll go ahead and get into some definitions that I found and that can kind of prompt some more discussion. So the, the first one that I thought I would share is that... Um, systematic desens desensitization was falling under this category called exposure therapy. And, uh, and that kind of, that word itself, exposure, was very enlightening. <laughs> so I'll just kind of read this to start out, that exposure therapy is a type of treatment for specific, ther or for specific phobias and is an intervention for use in treating other anxiety disorders. It involves having the learner repeatedly expose themselves to a feared stimulus until fear abates. The least demanding form of exposure is systematic desensitization. And I thought this was interesting. Flooding is also a type of exposure therapy. Hmm. So during exposure therapy, the learner is presented with a fear evoking stimuli, stimuli in a controlled prolonged fashion until the fear diminishes. The learner may be exposed to a real stimuli or simply imagine the um, stimuli. So obviously we don't do the imagined stuff with animals as far as we know. Um, exposure may be to intensely fear evoking stimuli or it may be gradual working up a hierarchy of feared stimuli, which is what we're thinking about with um, systematic desensitization. And um, I thought this was also um, an interesting point exposure should only be used if the learner is able to tolerate some degree of distress and is sufficiently motivated to overcome their fears of course that's talking about human learners so um, Cynthia says um, for maybe a definition presenting a stimulus below the animal's fear threshold which we would have to identify right what that looks like and gradually increasing the stimulus parameter while the animal stays below um, threshold so again that's it's kind of sounds along this line of uh, exposure right so that word exposure, you know, again, that, that kind of had some impact for me in terms of a procedure. So exposing an animal to, you know, a stimulus that may have evoked a fear response in the past, right? Okay, so those, that gives me some, some visual, you know, a visual picture of, of, of um, what, what, what this might look like. Uh, oh my God, are we going to have ABA kind of things? They have been applied to autistic kids for some time as well and only now recognized as being completely abusive in, in, in humans, that is. Well, um, well, everything is, uh, you know, related to behavior analysis here. Uh, so, so we are talking about behavior analysis, but, but, um, but it doesn't have to be abusive. So, um, you know, just how we learn is, is um, behavior analytic. I mean, this is just kind of, laws of, uh, how do we say it, laws of nature, so to speak, and they're just being described. We're just describing learning perce learning processes, so to speak. Um, so let's uh, talk about the systematic um, desensitization definition. So it's a least demanding exposure therapy used to, used to treat phobias and other behavior problems involving anxiety. Um, the learner experiences real or imaginal exposure that involves gradually working up a hierarchy of fear-evoking stimuli under the anxiety reaction to the stimuli is extinguished. 
um, typically combined with relaxation training. So, um, and I don't know if this is how you pronounce his name, Volpe is this how I thought it was, but I could be wrong. Um, uh, 1958 is sort of the guy that has been considered the person who's described systematic desensitization. Um, and then McGlynn is this other one who has published a lot on it. Um, and, it, and he says it involves three elements, progressive relaxation training, development of a hierarchy of fear evoking stimuli, imagined or real, and exposure to the hierarchy while practicing these relaxation techniques. So, so this is sort of the, you know, the textbook definition, right? Um, uh, and, uh, and Anne is saying exposure therapy can be abusive. So the, the, the last line is important. So, so what I'm giving you guys here is just sort of what's in the textbooks as far as definitions, right? So, so this is sort of, you know, a setup of, of what's out there in literature, but, but, you know, you guys, I want you guys to be aware of this because these are words, these are terms that we use in animal training. So what does that what does that look like though is the question that we need to ask ourselves right because we use these terms in animal training um yeah and so for me being autistic and says i have um and i have a negative association with the word exposure therapy i hear you <laughs> so so this is good this is good for us to explore these topics in more detail this is why we're we're going down this pathway i want you guys to have an understanding of what these words are associated with and what the learning processes involved are, um, um, are, are what the learning processes are that are going on there. Because we, we use these words all the time in animal training and we're saying, you know, we use these to change behavior. So I think it'd be good for us to have an understanding of what, what, what the processes are. So, so that's why we're taking this deep dive. <laughs> I find the term extinction in the definition interesting absolutely let's and that's why i think we uh we need to go down that that pathway even more all right so let's let's take the next step then all right it's kind of, i don't know if anyone's even thought about these definitions before <laughs> no problems with the words just what abd aba uh okay okay so well we're, we're not really talking about uh all all the controversies about various applications to humans we're we're gonna i can't i can't speak to all that so so i'm not an expert in all that we're just talking about various specific learning processes and procedures and trying to understand how they um how they work so i can't speak to all that stuff i'm afraid all right so let's uh let's talk a little bit more about how systematic desensitization might work. And the reason I wanna go through these with you is so that we can decide um, if these learning procedures are appropriate for what we wanna do with animals or not and where we might apply them and where we might not apply them. This is why we're having these conversations. All right, so how might systematic desensitization be working? And again, there's a lot, lots of literature on all this, and I'm gonna give you, those of you that are members, there are references um, that I'll provide you in our um, membership, so you can look these up yourselves and read them. So one way that it might be working is extinction, right? So if you look at that definition, the idea is that there is this exposure to an aversive stimulus, but the idea is that the exposure is at such a low level, which some of you described already in some of your definitions, and that the that the individual or animal is very calm and relaxed, and, the, and there's this hierarchy that was described there. So you figured out this hierarchy, and the animal is exposed at such a low level that the animal is very calm and relaxed. It sees that aversive stimulus and then there is an extinction response to that aversive stimulus. And then there's an exposure at a little higher level, and then there's an extinction response to that, that stimulus. Now, um, I'm not necessarily saying I'm defending systematic desensitization or not, um, but uh, we're gonna look at video examples and we're gonna also talk about alternatives, so keep that in mind. So this is one of the things that I had at the top of my questions. Let's go back to the topic here. I said, what other strategies have you used to address fear responses? So keep that in mind. That's one of the things that we we um, are gonna talk about here. So, um, so going back to one way that systematic desensitization 
is addressing a fear response is this gradual exposure, right? And then uh, extinction of the fear response. One of the things that was also mentioned in the definition is that there is an association of something appetitive at the same time. So some sort of, sort of counter conditioning. So when there's exposure to this aversive stimulus, there's also this appetitive association as associated. So they, they're saying counter conditioning. I think in the description they gave, I think they're saying that relaxation potentially for the human is the counter conditioning. What we tend to see with animal training is that people tend to associate food or something else of that's um, appetitive with the with the situation. We there's also the um, mention that habituation may also be going on. So let's talk about what that might look like in animal training, and this is where you guys may have some more thoughts. So I do think. In animal training, what we see is that people talk about gradual exposure to whatever that aversive stimulus may be. I think we see people talk about pairing appetitives with it. And I do think that it's possible that the appetitive may facilitate the extinction process. But I also think that um, there's in what people describe as systematic desensitization, that there's probably other things going on. Um, and this is where it gets a little confusing. I think sometimes there are things like positive reinforcement of, of responses going on. I think there's also negative reinforcement of things going on. I think there also might be stimulus fading going on. Um, and I think there's combination of these procedures going on and switching back and forth. And so I don't think what what people are doing in animal training is necessarily as cut and dry as what I described for you in the definition that was provided in the textbooks for the human world. But I think what we see when we observe animal training is that sometimes we do see this pressure to tolerate an aversive stimulus and then the fear response is extinguished and then there's more pressure put on the animal to um, tolerate the aversive uh, stimulus and then um, the fear response is extinguished and then there's more pressure put on and then the fear response is extinguished and then more pressure put on. I do think sometimes we observe that. I think sometimes too much pressure is put on and the animal says, no thanks, I'm out of here and they escape or avoid the aversive stimulus. I think sometimes we see too much pressure put on and there's an extinction burst and maybe the animal can't escape or avoid the situation. Maybe they're put in, in, a, in a situation where they can't use their behavior to get away. And so they, the fear response, you know, so they escalate in their fear response and then they give up. And so we see extinction bursts. I think sometimes we see conflicted responses where we see an animal where there's an appetitive is offered and they want the appetitive. And so they're trying to get the appetitive, but they're dealing with an aversive stimulus. And so we see that conflicted topography. And then sometimes I think we see success. We see people get the desired outcome they want. So I don't know, does any of that sound familiar to people? Do you guys sometimes see all those things happening in what has been described as potentially using systematic desensitization? Now is that starting to sound a little more familiar to people? <laughs> this is why I wanted to talk about it. So I know people got a, a little sensitive, but this is why we, we want to have these conversations so that we don't just immediately go, oh, systemat systematic desensitization is great or bad. We first need to know a little bit more about what we're talking about and um, so what the definitions are in, in the ABA stuff, what people think they're talking about, or in, in um, um, <laughs> I tend to use peer pressure to make it easier, um, or what, what people tend to be talking about in animal training, what they think they're describing, what we're actually seeing, and is it actually um, systematic desensitization? Is it something else? Is it a combination of things? What exactly is going on there? So this is the conversation, if that makes sense. So, um, so this is kind of where what I wanted to talk about. Uh, uh, have one animal have animal that is that is fearful, and one is that one that is comfortable. Okay, so you have you have some animals that are 
showing different responses. But so I'm going to, so let's look at some videos and that might help you guys a little bit um, visualize some of these things, especially what's on this slide here, because I think what we describe as systematic desensitization in animal training is all over the map. I think we have these different description of, descriptions of it, but um, but I don't think what what it actually I don't know that it matches all the time what is in the literature. I don't know that what's been published all the time is actually you know the same as what you know may be described and you know, it's just all over the place. <laughs> so so I'm going to show some videos and we can discuss those. And I'll kind of explain what's what's happening in the videos. Um, so in this first one, um, what had happened was people were going to um, target train some fish for a workshop that we were doing. And initially they had put all these sticks into the uh, aquarium that are used for target training fish. And the fish were terrified of the sticks. They were trying to get away from them. And so now they had to reintroduce these target sticks to the fish. And what you're gonna see is the person is just slowly inserting the, the target stick into the fish tank and the fish are just remaining calm. And I, I had labeled this, this video as systematic desensitization, but I don't know if that's what it is. <laughs> So let's just look at this video. And, um, and you'll see now the fish are calm, but she's bringing that target stick in very slowly. There is food inside the stick. If she gets it close enough to the fish, she can deliver food. So a part of me thinks that could be systematic desensitization because she's slowly introducing this in a way that the fish can tolerate. But it's not, but by definition, it's not really evoking a fear response that the fish um, are, you know, that's, and that the fish, you know, so that the fish have a little fear response and then it extinguishes and the fear and the fish have a little fear response and then it extinguishes and there's no counter conditioning going on. So I don't know if that's really systematic desensitization. So is it just stimulus fading? Is she just fading in an object and not, and not getting, you know, I'm sure they're aware of it. I, I mean, I know they're not facing it, but they're, but I'm sure they're aware it's coming in. So, so part of me thinks maybe it's just a stimulus fading procedure and then once it gets close enough, she'll deliver food and if they eat the food, then maybe it's, is it positive reinforcement for remaining calm in the presence of the object? It, I guess it would be counter condition if, if they contacted it at the same time they contacted the aversive stimulus, but the aversive stimulus is already present, but they're also not showing avoidance responses to the, the, the object anymore, so maybe it's not an aversive stimulus. <laughs> so, so, you know, there's a lot of questions to be asked there about what the procedure actually is in that moment. Um, and Chris thinks um, if the tank was bigger, would they be gone? She thinks they would be moving away. Um, I can say, based on what I remember prior to um, this clip taking, they really were actively, you know, like showing more of a panic type behavior. Um, you know, where they wouldn't eat, they were hiding behind the plants, they weren't coming this close to the the target stick, you know, they're, they're looking much more relaxed than they were before. So, so their behavior is much different than it was prior to what you're seeing in this video clip. Um, and Anne says, I love how Barbara makes this thing. <laughs> Are they being flooded? Says Anne. I don't think so. I think in the previous video they, they were being flooded, um, which I don't have for you, but prior to this, they're See, like the way the fish are behaving in this video, they're actually out swimming um, and um, moving around. Whereas previously to this, these fish were, were hiding behind those plants. 
they weren't moving around at all. So their behavior was very different um, than what you see in this particular clip. So that was one of the reasons why we felt like we were seeing better response. Um, you know, and, and so you think that they're they're not happy, that they're they're being uncomfortable. I, I disagree. <laughs> I disagree. I wish I had the before video to show you, but I would disagree. Yeah. So it, it was a much very different response um, uh, when the the um, target sticks were in the in the tank with them. Uh, but they are not. Uh, uh, you don't think they're comfortable? Yeah, I, I don't, it's, a, I wish I had the before video to show you, to show you the difference response. I, I should have looked for it, but I added this at the last minute this morning, so I didn't have time to look for it. Yeah, it was much different response. So the prior video, um, they were, they were actively swimming quickly away, trying to hide under plants, whereas here they're, they were, um, slowly moving and exploring things more often, which is not really so, um, so I'm sorry I don't have the before video to show you the comparison, but, but it's uh, definitely a much, much more imp improved response. Um, yeah, so, so I'm sorry I don't have the before to, sh to, to show you the comparison. But we'll look at another video to let you think a little bit more. So in this video, um, I, you know, this was the first time my parrot had been uh, introduced to a stethoscope. And I remember thinking, I'm, um, I'm, I was, uh, you know, using quote systematic desensitization and and uh, counter conditioning because I had slowly introduced the stethoscope and I was pairing it with food. But when I think about it now, again, you know, my my thoughts kind of go a little bit differently. You know, like is that delivery of food contingent on her behavior because that that would make it more of an operant procedure you know would would i have continued to move that stethoscope forward if she showed me a fear response probably not so that also is different from, than systematic desensitization right so if it came forward um and she showed a fear response, she could back away from it, right? So, so again, that's, that's different than systematic desensitization. So this kind of falls more in the land of, of, of a, you know, an, an operant procedure, if that makes sense, right? Um, Oh, here's a good point. Isn't the point of desensitization to reverse an, a negative emotional response? It's the first time. How can it be um, SD, systematic desensitization? Oh, thank you for that comment. Yes, we're going to get into that in a, in a, in a moment. Yes, um, very good point. Um, we are going to get into that, and I'm glad that you brought, brought that up. So, yeah, so we didn't see... Um, a fear response, um, or, or quote, an emotional response, uh, and uh, and so how how can it be um, systematic desensitization? Excellent point. Thank you for that. All right, so let's um let's look at something else. So uh, that might be. Hmm, which one should I show then first? Maybe I'll show. Let's look at. Okay, let me, do I want to set this up or do I want to go, I'll go back to here. Let's talk about, um, okay, I'm going to show you a cheetah video. And we, and um, this animal we do know um, might react to touch, um, has, react to has reacted to touch in the past. And so we are intentionally... I'm going to do some things so so that we hope that he won't react to the touch because um, we had a training session with the, with him the day before, um, and uh, and so so here are some things we're going to do to um, address his uh, his response to touch. Um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, okay, so let's uh, let's look at this cheetah. Um, and there's audio on this. And, uh, and just a, a heads up, the person that's um, doing the training at the head of the cat is kind of new to training. So giving, giving a bit of coaching through the process. Um, and the cat is 
very brand new to laying on top of this platform so there's a lot of a lot of reinforcement coming fast for just laying down as well so um so i'll let you watch this you could try bringing it close what i would try is like bringing it near his front paw there where he can see it yeah touch yep good <laughs> that's okay and then you can Great. He thinks it's a sick and talk. That's okay. <laughs> but if it grazes his front paw, that's okay. Let's try and keep him laid down if we can. <laughs> Let's try and get him back down, Rohan. Like a race. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. yeah. Try targeting him down low again. You're always thinking about laying down. So, oh, there you go. And now just feed him down low, and let's just keep feeding him down low so he stays down. And that way Ad Adriana can work on trying to touch him again. I, I, yeah. Just showing it. Yeah. And that's good having him look her direction so that she that he sees her coming. I think look from lower so yeah. But he's so focused that we need to. Yeah. So what we'll try and do, Rowan, is she's gonna say touch. And when she says says touch, that's when you give her give the cat food, okay? Yeah. yeah. So whenever you're ready, Adrian. Touch. Okay. the food. <laughs> okay. He's eating. Gonna run out of food soon. Yeah. Touch. Getting food all the time now. So. Yeah. Okay, so let's wait till she says touch, Rohan. Oh. <laughs> so wait, wait, oh, wait Ro Rohan. Keep a little bit of food. Oh. Yeah, wait till she says touch. She's going to reach for the tail. Touch. I think he's on his, about his last bite, yeah. so. At least now I touch the tail. Yeah. He's getting a bit used to that. Okay. I think that's all he's got. Bye. I think that's it. <laughs> yeah. But we got there. <laughs> you would like some more food for sure. Yeah. 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 Is there a bit more in the yeah. You could. Okay, so so more food for thought there. It kind of goes back to our um, our questions at the top here about all these combinations of things <laughs> that might be going on there. So we saw, you know, that this animal's been trained to lay on the platform and there's positive reinforcement for laying on the platform. But we also know that this animal may react to touch in a way that is, hey, I'm not so sure if I'm comfortable with that. So there's also some procedures there in place to introduce touch in a way that we hope will not evoke a fear response. And so we tried touching in, a, in um, around the foot where we thought would be less likely to create a fear response. You'll notice that, so, so we kind of have our little hierarchy of touch. Our goal is to touch this cat at its tail because what we were working towards was a blood draw from the tail, which, you know, behind the cat, place where the cat isn't gonna see the person very well. And um, obviously we're using an object uh, first, we're touching in a place where the animal can see. And what we also did was we paired it with food at the exact moment that touch was happening. So elements of that to me have some of this systematic desensitization slash counter conditioning component there 
but also, you know, there's some positive reinforcement going on there as well. So I see components of that. I think as we transition to delivering reinforcers after those things are happening, that it could turn into more of a contingency, right? So that the animal allows these things to happen and then reinforcers are delivered afterwards. So I think we have some combinations of procedures going on there and we eventually could switch to it being a more um, operant procedure. So I think that might be going on there. Just my, my thoughts on it. But I think one of the things that was mentioned here by, by my initials, <laughs> Yeah, and, uh, um, and as mentioned, the man dispensing the meat def definitely got less anxious with more repetition. Timing really is everything. Yeah, and also the, me the mechanics of practicing this. This was uh, new for him. He wasn't used to delivering small pieces of food. <laughs> so he was uh, practicing as well. And even though he has a super fantastic relationship with those animals, um, that was all uh, a, new, a new thing for him as well. Um, but uh, as BH mentioned, I want to put this up here, is that, um, and this is a really important part to this whole discussion, and I think something that all of you um, who were having some concerns can really relate to, is that um, what we observe with animals um, is that they're using their behavior in response to aversive stimuli or conditions. And this can include escape and avoidance responses. And um, it can also include other undesired responses such as destructive behaviors or vocalizations or aggressive responses when conditions don't allow um, animals to use their behavior to get relief. So, you know, um, there were, one of the papers I read was about separation anxiety. And um, so you think of that as an aversive condition, may not be a fear response, but they were the, the paper was talking about using um, systematic desensitization and counter conditioning to address separation anxiety and um, and and I think you know what I'm going to suggest here is an alternative um, response to um, to that procedure so I think this is a really important statement here which relates to the comment that BH made um, that um, the two-factor model um, would propose that fears are acquired by classical conditioning and maintained by operant conditioning and this is a quote, the most important form of operant conditioning is negative reinforcement where avoidance or escape from fear evoking stimuli is reinforced by the behaviors of escape, uh, avoidance or escape, which results in the removal from unpleasant states of fear or distress. So systematic, de uh, systematic desensi desensitization procedures focus on el elimination of the emotional response, right? Um, However, you guys may recall that one of the things we've talked a lot about is emotions as con contingency descriptors. And this comes from that work from Israel Gold Diamond. And you may remember that paper that um, Joe Lang shared with us about emotions as contingency descriptors. Um, so if we change the contingency, basically we change the environment, we can change the behavior and therefore change the fear emotions. So if we focus on letting animals use their behavior, we actually change the emotions. So instead of trying to eliminate the emotion, we actually can help let the animal learn new behaviors will get the desired outcome. And then by default, that changes the emotional behavior or changes the emotional behavior, which in, in turn changes the behavior or changes the emotions. So that gives us an alternative. And that alternative is to teach the animal under conditions in which they can emit desired responses that the aversive um, stimulus will be removed or, the, uh, or the aversive conditions will be, will be changed. So we can let them use their behavior to get the outcomes they desired. So this changes the procedure from exposure in which the animal has pretty much little or no ability to change, to control the outcome. It's just sort of exposure, extinct, extinction, exposure, extinction, exposure, extinction, um, to an operant procedure in which they get to use their behavior to get the, um, the result they desired. So, but that means we've got to set it up, right? We've got to set it up so that they can have that kind of success and they learn that they have control over the situation. So, 
And you may be thinking, what the heck does that look like? <laughs> well, you've actually seen this a bunch of times because um, we've looked at it many, many times in lots of videos. So I'm going to give you um, an example. Um, so first of all, let's look at a giraffe example in response to touch. So I just showed you that, that cheetah, but let's look at a different way of teaching touch. Um, and this is with a giraffe that you're first going to see a before um, where it is kind of that strategy of pairing food with the touch. But you're going to see this giraffe is sort of like, mm -hmm, I'm not really into it. So what could we do instead? So as we all know, it gets a little repetitive to watch <laughs> all the, all the um, approximations. So I sped it up for you. But the nice thing is this, this goes pretty quick. And you see he, put, he took himself away. So we're waiting till he's back back in position before she removes herself. criteria. So I, I hope that you can see um, that, you know, they were giving him food in the beginning of the video. And in fact, um, they have been trying to, to work on touching his neck for quite a while by just giving him food. So what was really important there was that teaching him that the aversive stimulus will go away for calm responses. So, so that operant portion is really important. Um, and, and an alternative 
to just using counter conditioning and gr gradually bringing something closer and waiting for that fear response to extinguish. So it's a, it's a really important thing to consider um, as an alternative to addressing fear responses uh, and, um, and really, ad I think, addresses the, the, um, the point that was being made there earlier. So, um, but just to take it a little bit further, <laughs> Um, I will say one thing that I, I, I do think about though is, so let's say with that, um, giraffe, I want to work on now, I want to work on sticking a needle in that giraffe's neck, um, and teaching it to tolerate pain. Um, I do flip back to some of the things that we talked about earlier and I do pair giving food at the exact moment when I'm you know, poking the neck, um, or, or, um, working towards more intense sensations that need to happen with, um, needle insertion. Um, anyone who's worked on giraffe injections, they have incredibly thick skin. It's really difficult to poke a needle through there. And so teaching tolerance for pain, um, does take some pretty, uh, pretty, pretty intense work. And so I do have a video to kind of show you what we did with that on another giraffe. And what we do after we've gone through some steps of pairing that food, food at the exact same time that we're touching with various objects, then what we work towards is putting pauses in between um, uh, giving food after we've done various pokes and prods. And so it does transition away from, from uh the touch at the same time of delivering and again we increase the intensity of the poke and the prod and the whatever so it seems to have these elements of sd and counter conditioning going on to introduce the the touch so i'll let you watch that and see if you can see the kind of the the difference between these things touch yeah you gave us a little yeah a little flinch touch it's sort of whatever is similar to what you might need to do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we also kind of, yeah, I kind of have to wait till he's done chewing so he's ready to eat. <laughs> it was like, Ooh, that was weird. So if I push this before, then it kind of almost leans into it. Is that better? Um, it, it helps with positioning, yeah. yeah. And we can also teach him to move into injections, obviously. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it might have to be a little bit of a lighter yeah. poke. But sometimes, as you know, with giraffes, sometimes light is ir is more irritating than hard. Sometimes the light touch is like flies. When he's ready, yeah. Good. Yeah. I think that's a good idea. I did this torture training. Huh? I know. Touch. <laughs> so maybe now we count one, two before we give the food and see if he waits. Touch. 
One, two. Yeah. <laughs> nice. I'll show you one more video to kind of um, go back to how the negative reinforcement contingency is really an effective way to address these fear responses. And um, uh, just to bring it back to this alternative to consider. And because I think it, it's a really nice example of body language. And I know we have some people here that work with hoof stock. And so I think you might appreciate this one. So. Um, with this donkey, you're really going to see her body language and how she shows us that she's not comfortable approaching the scale and getting on the scale. And although in this particular clip, you'll see we don't get all the way on the scale, you'll really see how we're able to uh, decrease the distance and that she's willing to come closer to a scale and how her body language changes by, by just using the, the opportunity to reinforce calm body language by having her go away. Actually, I'm going to show you two videos. I'll show you the donkey first and I'll show you a giraffe one because the giraffe one's pretty dramatic, the change. Um, but again, the idea is you're going to see um, when they first bring her closer to the scale, you're going to see her body language showing that, oh, I don't want to get close to that. And then instead what we do is we bring her um, close enough that her body language is relaxed and comfortable and then we remove her from the scale when we see she's come as close as she's going to come with calm and relaxed body language. So what we do by remo removing her there at that distance is we're reinforcing calm body language instead of bringing her really close where she's stretching her neck out and then removing her because then we're reinforcing that stretched out body language and that fear response. What we want to reinforce is calm body language and that gets you removal from the aversive stimulus. So hopefully that makes sense and I'll let you watch it's a long video, so I might I might skip ahead towards the end, but I'll let you see the beginning, and then I'll bring it um, towards the the end. Oh, the goats are all running back. <laughs> a little bitey. Oh, you say no way. Okay. Okay. So she is a good candidate for that, um, some of the procedures we did there. So um, yeah, because you see the conflict, right? It's the negative reinforcement contingency paired with the positive reinforcement. So we've got the hesitancy. So she's saying this is an aversive stimulus. Yeah, yeah. so, um, so what we want to do with her is we want to bring her forward, but only to the place that her body language is relaxed. And then we're going to move her away from the aversive stimulus. So hopefully you can see what we're reinforcing. So we want that really, you know, kind of nice head upright, ears forward, instead of her stretching her neck forward to try and get the food. We have to use the food to bring her forward because that's how we, you know, tell her come forward and we reinforce that walking forward. But um, so that's part of it. Oh, and Chris says this is what can be used for trailing load, or load or, or trailer loader training for horses, donkeys, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, same idea. It's just any, you know, any kind of um, aversive condition or stimulus in which you're not bringing the aversive towards the animal, but the animal needs to come towards the aversive. So again, you know, we're, we're very intentionally not trying to have her stretch her body. We're trying to keep her kind of her, her weight over her legs and her head upright and just little tiny bits closer and closer as you can see she 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 inches forward but she she kind of keeps her keeps her weight over her legs so to speak we're not having her lean and stretch to get the food um, and I'm I think I am going to show you one more video where you'll see that leaning and stretching compared to this nice 
keeping your body upright so you can see the difference. I'll show I'll show you what that looks like with a giraffe. Um, okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna skip this ahead because you get the idea here. So I'll show you how far we got. Um, yes, now I was asking that to Wanda, and she said that with these type of um, oh, really close. Yeah, that was a great one. Oh yeah, watch the donkey tail. It says a, a lot afraid. about emotion. Yeah, we actually yeah. mentioned yeah. that too. That she where I she mean, was switching her, switching nice. her tail. Yeah, and you can see her ears go back there. <laughs> Good. Oh, she just moved her foot yeah. again. Yeah. Same yeah. with giraffes. <laughs> Good call, Miriam. I think it's time to go back again. Yeah, I would reinforce that with some distance yes, and see exactly. if you can get another rep. But I think you're right that you maybe having to get on the scale might be something to start getting her more towards the center because she might start to walk around it. Okay. So um, for this giraffe one, what you're going to see is sort of a before and after of. Um, teaching a giraffe to go into a chute and it's kind of the same idea you're going to see before using sort of this you know kind of asking the animal to do more than it's comfortable with versus using removing the animal from the aversive stimulus and only bringing it to a point where it's comfortable and then asking it to back out so same idea except the chute is the aversive stimulus And you'll see the giraffe take herself out of the chute when it becomes too much, which is like, this is, this is too aversive. Yeah, she's back. So now yeah, we I like can how she stretch. took big steps right there. Yeah. A certain distance, and then like you didn't have to inch her along. <laughs> She's like, oh, yum. <laughs> what have you got there? She's just figuring it out. Yeah.
was, you know, our success in one session. So I think, you know, by, and, she, and prior to that, they had been, you know, trying to inch her along for quite a long time. But by basically saying, you know, we'll, we'll take you to the point that you're comfortable, reinforce that, and then also reinforce that by allowing you to remove yourself, um, progress, progress was made really fast. So um, to kind of recap this, uh, this discussion, which, you know, very fascinating, I think. Um, so systematic desensitization is a form of exposure therapy. It's been used to address fear, phobias, and anxiety. Um, in animal training, the, you know, the way we think it's been used is the learner is exposed to a gradually increasing hierarchy of fear-evoking stimuli until the anxiety reaction to the stimulus is um, extinguished. Typically, this exposure is associated with an impetitive stimulus. Depending on the application of the procedure, this is this is where it gets fuzzy to me. I don't I don't know that we are all speaking the same language um, in terms of what it looks like, but it may be a process of extinction, counter conditioning, or habituation. Um, it may be stimulus fading. It may be a combination of these processes in a procedure that facilitate desired results. It's it's probably not just um, uh, systematic des desensitization. There may also be reinforcement going on there. I don't know that we um, all are, you know, doing the same thing um, and just, and labeling it the same thing. Uh, it's hard. It's hard to say. So I think it's uh, something that it would be interesting to have um, more conversations about, so that we uh, we are are maybe clear about what what it is uh, for our community. Um, but I think the other, other thing to consider is that because escape and avoidance to aversive stimuli are operant responses, an alternative is to focus on using operant conditioning to teach responses under conditions in which the animal can emit the desired response when aversive stimuli are present. Um, these responses can result in the outcome the animal seeks, distance from the aversive stimulus, ultimately resulting in desired emotional responses, which we learned a lot about from uh, Joe Lang and Israel Gold Diamond. So, so um, when little or no response has been observed, maybe a procedure usually utilizing um, systematic des desensitization, <laughs> I can't say it, may prevent undesired responses. Um, but maybe once or escape or avoidance has been noted, negative reinforcement may be the more helpful approach. Um, and again, there might be some circumstances where, like you saw with the injection training, where that's that may where it may be more applicable. But um, yeah, so it's kind of an interesting topic. It's it's not so cut and dry, I think, in our world and um, in the world of animal training, and certainly something that I hope. Uh, Hope you guys will explore a little bit more, think about a little bit more, and um, and uh, chew on. And maybe we can discuss tomorrow because we have a tower talk tomorrow, members. Uh, so I hope you will join me for that. I should make a, a little notice notice of that. We are having a tower talk tomorrow at 11 o'clock Central Time. So if you are a member, log in to the uh, membership program and get that Zoom link. And we will discuss this in more detail because I think this one has us all scratching our heads and thinking a little bit more. Um, there is a citation for this particular discussion. We are encouraging people to um, uh, cite uh, where you learn things. Um, a reminder that um, I did do a presentation on Christmas Eve, uh, Christmas Day for those in Japan, and that is now available. I did make the recording available on animaltrainingfundamentals.com. I put the, the the YouTube link there. Uh, also, we have um, some new goats presentations coming up in January. This one with Jonathan Amy, which is all about. This is this is really cool one because it's it's really about the components that make up. A behavior and how to make them fluent and then a new announcement speaking of emotions and emotional behavior oh my gosh um, Anna Linehan, Linehan is going to be speaking about this topic so this is really relevant to what we discussed today and for those of you that are not members you can get a taste of what animal training fundamentals is all about um, because there is a free course still available at animaltrainingcourse.com that one's going to expire on the 31st though so I encourage you heavily to um, take advantage of that and if you are not a member please do join us there are so many courses and I've got um, a whole list of new courses that I'm going to be adding soon uh, now that I'm home for a little bit. So um, I hope you will join us. And I see a comment. Um, I, I love the way this was done. 
Uh, instead of exposure being forced to tolerate the situation, he gave the animal space to go on and retreat, actually use the brain instead of drowning in panic. Yeah, that is the that is one of the really important things I wanted to get to in this particular discussion that um, that we've learned about this this difference between sort of using that respondent approach and the operant approach and, and that we learned that, um, you know, escape and avoidance are, are behaviors that animals use to avoid aversive stimuli so we can take advantage of teaching them ways to, to use their behavior um, in a way that is, you know, under conditions in which they can be successful. That's the really important part. And so that's how we've been learning a lot that, um, you know, negative reinforcement isn't a bad thing if we apply it in a way that, that is, a, um, you know, as you saw in these videos today, a way that can be successful for them. So, so uh, thank you for for hanging in there. I know so, uh, in the beginning there it was a little triggering for people, but sometimes it's important to have those conversations so that we can uh, understand what's going on there and help us move on to useful information and and get to the get to the stuff that helps us do do what we can to help our animals be successful. So. Cool, and uh, and uh, thank you so much for ta taking this topic up. Looking forward to the Tower Talk tomorrow. Awesome stuff, thank you. Good comments from everyone, I appreciate that. And uh, uh, great to see you all here, and thank you for joining me after a few weeks off. I know it was a long one, but, uh, but look what we got out of it. We got some more fun videos to look at and explore and discuss all these interesting topics. Um, and uh, Sarayas is great, awesome. So I, I have a feeling I'll see a bunch of you tomorrow and we can we can talk about all this a little bit more and get into some more details so i appreciate that and you we hung around a little bit later uh love everyone doing what they can and thank you for this one all right well i appreciate that okay guys well i, I kept you a little bit late today sorry about that but we had so many cool videos to look at <laughs> and a thank you from dante camacho all right good job guys um i'll see you tomorrow then at 11 my time um and uh and we'll talk to you again. All right. Have a good day. Bye, everybody.